Well, I bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters in faith who claim First Grace United Church of Christ as their faith family. I bring greetings of peace and hope and joy to you all. Both of our congregations have a long history in Akron. Histories of being mighty houses of worship and work, standing like fortresses on the north and the west hillsides of the city. Some may fear that our heydays have passed, that part of our history marks much larger memberships. I know that First Grace at one time boasted of having 1,200 members. Today, that number is more accurate, around 250. I don't know if Trinity shares a similar story, but there are those in the church who have an interest in the past, who remember when, and who set points in history as markers which are no longer met, and which they believe are indications that the church is in decline. However, I would argue that at first grace at least, although worship attendance is less than in the 50s, the amount of witness and mission done by the congregation today dwarfs what was done in the past. I once visited with our most senior Sunday school class and asked them to give me the names of the persons they were personally responsible for bringing into the membership of the church over the past 10 years they were unable to name one person. My response was, I know that you do not understand or accept all of the things we are doing to grow the church, but you have to admit that whatever you were doing for the past 10 years doesn't work. All of us need to have a vision for First Grace 50 years from now, knowing that none of us in this room will be here 50 years from now but we have to be prepared to hand this church on to those who will come after us. I promise you that the church will not abandon you, that, the, that we will be here in your aging years, and we will celebrate your life when you die. But for now, I ask only that you not block what needs to be done to keep this church faithful for years to come. We, they and I, have lived in peace ever since that day. When Jesus took three disciples up the mountain one day, they carried with them a significant amount of history. They knew the story of their faith, and they knew the story of their people. And to some degree, they were stuck in that history, not fully aware that with Jesus, they were now making history and setting a new vision of what God's kingdom was all about. Peter, James, and John were probably familiar with Jesus' customs of trying to escape to a more quiet place in order to pray and consider what it was God wanted to do through him. Another hike up the hill was all they may have considered this to be. But then something totally different happened. Jesus has guests from the past. Moses and Elijah, two of the heroes of their Jewish faith, are consulting with Jesus. The disciples are too far away to hear what is being said, but they know this is big. Why else would these guys be here? And then they heard the voice from the sky. It's on the front of your bulletin, I think. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. If there had been any lingering doubt in their minds up until this point about who this Jesus was, who called them to become a vagabond gang of disciples following him from village to village, then such doubt was set aside that day. What they experienced of Jesus was a changed man. The text actually says that he was transfigured. He was different than what he once was. Now he clearly understood his mission, a mission that would put him in a position of shaking things up in ways that would lead to his execution on a cross. This was one of those monumental events. And Peter, Peter, 
Peter took on a Martha Stewart role of trying to set up housekeeping on the mountain. Jesus rejected his offer to make three booths to house Jesus and his two faithful companions. Peter's attempt to keep the moment alive, to more or less freeze time so that nothing bad could happen, so that nothing would change, so that Jesus would not get on with that which would result in his death. Jesus' transfiguration had taken place, and time now was of the essence. The clock was ticking, and Jesus had work to do. Back down the mountain they would go to return to work, looking for lost sheep, fishing for followers, serving those whom family, society, faith, and politics had abandoned. That's the way it is with our mountaintop experiences, isn't it? We can't live there forever. And no matter how much we try, whenever we attempt to replicate a mountaintop experience, it's not quite the same as it was the first time. And just because we don't live on the mountain all the time doesn't mean we forget what happened on the mountain. Those memories of big events are those touch points from which we can remember that we moved forward. Life goes on. And our mountaintop experiences are times which can give us rest, but also new purpose. The staff at First Grace hates it when I go on vacation. Actually, they probably like it when I leave. But they dread it when I come back. I've had too much time to think, too much time to wonder what if, too much time to find peace and quiet, and to be visited by the still small voice of our still speaking God. Too much time to work around in my mind the pitfalls and the speed bumps. It's not just the tan I get on my face at the beach. My whole spirit is uplifted. I come back a changed man. They worry that I will come back transfigured. Even the church attorney is in on this. I had an email from him this week that started out with the question of whether or not I had my toes in the sand. He knows that I usually have something new for him when I come back from vacation, something that usually drives him crazy. But that's what we pay him for, right? When the disciples came back the mountain with Jesus, they probably knew or feared that their lives too were going to be changed by what happened with Jesus, that they would be transfigured by proxy, a transfiguration which will take place over time and which they will need to keep in mind after Jesus is no longer with them. Thomas G. Long tells the story of a minister who always asked the same theological question of every ordination candidate he interviewed. He was, had been asking this same question for 30 years. He begins by asking the candidate to look out the window. The puzzled examinee peers out the window and the old minister adds, tell me when you see a person out there. I see one, the candidate will say. Do you know that person personally? Usually the answer is no, I don't. Good. Now my question is this. Will you please describe that person theologically? Trust me. A seminary student getting ready for ordination is panicked by that question. In three decades of experience in asking that question, the seasoned minister found that the candidates tend to give one of two different answers. Some will say something like, that person is a sinner in need of the redemption of Jesus Christ. Others, however, will respond, whether they know it or not, that person is a child of God loved and upheld by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Do you hear the difference between those two answers? One looks upon strangers as persons as sinners who need to be saved by Jesus Christ. The other sees persons as children of God, saved already by the grace of God. I suppose this minister reflects that technically both of the answers are theologically correct, but my experience that those who give the second answer, well, they make better ministers. The reason, of course, is that they have the gift of transfiguration discernment. They are able to see people in the present tense, in the middle of their circumstances, but they are able to see more than just the present. They can also see them 
as they were at the beginning of creation and as they will be in God's future. A beloved child of God. I believe that this same transfiguration discernment is valid for churches as well as for ministers, except it works both ways. The question would be, how do people view churches? What will you say are the common conceptions of people on the street about our churches, First Grace and Trinity? From all outward appearances, we look like all the rest. An imposing presence in the neighborhood, big brick fortresses not always appearing to be welcoming. There's a lot of guessing as to what is waiting for them behind our big wooden and steel doors. The challenge to us is to continue living our faith life in ways that become completely evident to those who happen by our door. That it spills out into the streets. The goal here is that we not just be transfigured, but that we live out our transfiguration in ways that will truly demonstrate the love, salvation, peace, and hope which God would have our world know and experience. The goal is that we live out our transfiguration in such positive ways that people's curiosity will not allow them to stay away. They will want to experience for themselves what makes us different from most of the others. And with that experience, they too will be transfigured. You, 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 Trinity United Church of Christ, you have made several bold steps. A traditionally Euro-American congregation, you have called an African-American to be your pastor. Do you really really understand how bold that event has been to the community. But wait, there's more. Your motto is what? Oh, a bold statement for sure. I hope you realize that you have made your church vulnerable to the community that you have made a statement by which you are going to be continually judged. You have set a standard which the community will be testing to simply say, see how true to your word you are. Good for you to see whether you really do have the community at your heart. But one of the things that really stands out for me in this morning's gospel reading from 1st Mark is the leper's conditional plea to Jesus for healing. He asked Jesus to heal him in the NRSV translation. He says, if you choose, will you heal me if you choose? In essence, he is giving room for Jesus to decide whether or not he wants to heal this man. And does it puzzle us as to why this man would say this? Well, he's a leper. He probably has attempted every known remedy of his day with no success. He may have even sought the help of religious types in the past to pray away the malady with no success. Truly, he now makes this one last attempt to be healed. He approaches the one of whom popularity and wonder are growing at a rapid pace. Keep in mind, this story comes from 1st Mark. We're still in this story in the first chapter of Mark. Mark is still introducing us to who this man Jesus is, and bang, here's this story. And it is part of the history that the disciples drag up the mountain on Jesus' day of transfiguration. In desperation, the man comes to Jesus with his conditional plea. He comes leaving the door open for one more disappointment. But his hope drives him to inform Jesus that he totally believes that Jesus can do this thing. And if, he do, if, it, if it doesn't happen, it will be because Jesus decided not to heal him. He has faith enough to believe that Jesus can do this thing, but that he might choose not to. Why would he have such fear? Well, in his day, it was judged that a person who had leprosy was being punished by God for some sin they committed. From the onset of his disease, people had turned against him. He was viewed as a sinner of extreme proportions, one whom they did not want to be around in case his sin and his leprous punishment were both contagious. Rejected, 
rejected by family, by friends, by society in general, by the religious leaders, the man now approaches Jesus, giving him the option to reject him as well. But Jesus, Jesus does not reject him. Actually, Jesus chooses to reach out and touch the man, a shocking event in the mind of anyone observing the scene. And Jesus chooses to heal the man, telling the man to go to the priest to get his clean bill of health and to not tell anyone who did this. Yeah, like that's going to happen. The man instead chose to go about giving full credit to Jesus for his healing, for his reentry into community, his neighborhood, his family, and his religious community because Jesus chose to heal him. Well, sisters and brothers in Christ, when we get down to it, it's always, always a matter of choice, is it not? The man's family and friends and community and faith family all chose to accept the common mores of their day that the man was sinful and punished, and for that reason they chose to have nothing to do with him. The man, rejected and desperate, chose to approach Jesus as a last resort for his healing and restoration. And Jesus chose to act against all the judgments of all his contemporaries to heal and restore the man to wholeness. John A. Stroman, in his book, God's Downward Mobility, writes, Jesus always met men and women on the level of their need, regardless of who they were or what they had done. He met everyone as human beings, never as stereotypes. Stereotypes were as powerful then as they are now. Once a label is placed on a person, the human being vanishes. For too many church folks, what happens on Sunday mornings is simply going through the motions of giving lip service to decision making and not allowing faithful decisions to inform the rest of the week. Critics both in and out of the church call such persons what? Hypocrites, and rightly so. Hypocrites are persons who say one thing and do another, who say they make choices based on the principles that Jesus taught, but who are really tied to the old world, the pre-faith world from which they came, where decisions are made on the basis of mores, customs, prejudice, rumor, and lies, instead of the new world order that Jesus was introducing as he reached out to the leper, confronting all of those who had stopped making choices for themselves. Walter Rauschenbusch is a hero of mine. Does anyone recognize that name? Well, that's okay. He was a social gospel theologian at the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah, 100 years ago. He described Jesus with these words. Whenever Jesus healed, he rendered a social service to his fellows. The spontaneous tenderness which he put into his contact with the sick was an expression of his sense of the sacredness of life. A leper with fingerless hands and decaying joints was repulsive to the aesthetic feelings and a menace to the selfish fear of infection. The community quarantined the lepers in waste places by stoning them when they crossed bounds. Jesus not only healed this man, but his sense of humanity so went out to him that he stretched forth his hand and touched him. Even the most wretched specimen of humanity still had value to Jesus. Jesus had a focused view of the religious of his day and how they had separated themselves from people in need. Instead of inviting people in and ministering to them, barricades were erected to keep a wall of separation between those who boasted that they had it right and those whom they judged to be without any sense of righteousness. They were persons who did not have the community at heart. Who are you? Motto, please. Oh, they weren't you. They weren't you. But there are those who will try to silence our proclamation. Today, political religious types will describe food stamp recipients as lazy and suggest that living on food stamps is not a safety net but a hammock. And they will describe persons living on any form of government support as leeches, users of street drugs who need to be tested and proven clean in order to receive further support, a theory that has been proven wrong in Florida. And not only is it bad enough that leaders choose to make such claims, but what is even worse is that there are millions of our fellow citizens, millions of our fellow church folk who choose to believe such nonsense. 
Show me where Jesus called a beggar la lazy. Show me where Jesus denied his energy to heal someone who asked. Show me where Jesus was silenced when, he confronted, when confronted by the religious or political leaders of his day. Show me where Jesus would choose to not publicly reach out to all persons in a way that challenged and mocked those who judged, the very ones who chose to lock out those who they should have been welcoming in and serving. Jesus introduced a new definition of the kingdom of God and described in his teaching and in his actions a vision of what that kingdom looks like. But let's be clear. Let's be clear the kingdom is far from complete. One of my, one of my catch motto phrases, and I've lived long enough to hear somebody quote me from the, their pulpit, if Jesus were to have a snap inspection, he would not be impressed. Think about it. All that Jesus proclaimed for his church, if Jesus were to have a snap inspection, I'm afraid he would not be impressed. Just as there are the, were those in Jesus' day who would do everything in their power to make sure that there would be a judged class who would not be welcome among the religious elite, those types exist today. Too many churches pride themselves on being the right place for the right people while missing what it really means to be members of God's welcoming team. Jesus, in his transfiguration, became the initiator of what that kingdom would look like, but he left it to those who would choose to follow him to be the interpreters and agents of that kingdom. It falls to us, brothers and sisters in Christ, to be those interpreters and agents. We need to be relentless in our choosing to say and do what Jesus would have us say and do. We need to be relentless in our advocacy for those who are victims of systems of bad government, restricted health care, unemployment, Poor education, systems which discriminate, intimidate, and violate the very principles of God's coming kingdom. And by doing so, we need to acknowledge from the top that by crossing over the divisions that generations before us have so craftily created, we are going to be criticized, we're going to be condemned, we're going to be ridiculed, and perhaps even hurt by persons who will have only rage at the notion of changing what they foolishly think is comfortable. We must be transfigured because the church is still far less than what God, Christ's promised kingdom of God is to be like. And as always, the choice is ours. Amen.